exciting to be here at the Year of Miracles for the Winter Workshop. You know, I'm so honored uh, to be with you all here tonight. Uh, super honored to be in the battle with the McGees, with the Bentleys, with the McGee Seniors. To be in the battle with the Tampa Bay International Christian Church. And to be in the battle with the mighty Daytona Beach International Christian Church. You know, I pray that all of us may know that the Lord's love endures forever. Amen. And because his love endures forever, that should produce miracles from the love that God graciously gives us. Amen. The title of the charge that I've been given tonight is called to be miracle workers. Let's pick it up in our text here in Matthew. You know, I pray that all of us may know that God has called us to not be people who sit around and watch things happen, on, but who make things happen. On, in Matthew chapter 9, in verse 35, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You know, I love, notice that Jesus took the initiative. He didn't expect people to come to him. It was he who sought after these people. And if we look at the world we live in today, it is the same story even thousands of years today. You look at the people today and they are helpless. They are harassed like sheep without a shepherd. Because since the beginning of time, people have decided to go and create what they believe is going to fill the void in their hearts. But you see, tonight, we're not here to uplift each other with motivational speeches. Tonight, we're not here to just choose the scriptures that make us feel good. Tonight, we are here because God has called us to be miracle workers. And because Jesus always gives us the greatest example to imitate, the issue is, is that they will not seek they must be sought. They will not learn. They must be taught. They will not come to Jesus unless they are brought. You see, as disciples of Jesus, we have been given the promised Holy Spirit that lives in us that resurrected Jesus from the dead. And it's that same spirit that as we sit and study the Bible with people, that raises them spiritually from the dead. Amen. You see, the question arises for all of us here tonight. What would happen if Jesus had waited for us to come to him? Do you think we would have come? Jesus had to go after each and every single person. Why? Because the people who were put in place to guide them to the true good shepherd, who were the Pharisees, had abandoned their duty to God. So when Jesus saw his people, that they were harassed, they were helpless, it was because of the leadership that was in place. People who only desired what their itching ears wanted to hear. People that desired to fill their stomachs more than to fill people up with the Spirit of God inside of them. What are we doing each day to influence the decision of these people and their eternal destiny? We would do well to remember that every disciple that is here tonight that has been baptized into Christ is a missionary. And every heart that is without Christ, that is your mission field. The word here that, that Jesus and that the word of God uses when he says that he had 
compassion on them. The word used for compassion is actually the strongest word for pity in the Greek language that it doesn't even have a word for the incredible amount of pity that Jesus had on them. Could you imagine the compassion that moved him in seeing these people not have a sort of direction or purpose for their life? Could you imagine people aimlessly going through life not knowing the call and the love, the grace and mercy that God had for their life. It describes the love that moves a person to the depths of their inner being. Are you all moved tonight to be miracle workers? You see, Roy Fish, years ago, had an infant son who had an illness that brushed him nearly to the point of death. And Fish's heart broke at the thought of his son dying. As his fragile body lay in the hospital bed, the only thing that was going through Fish's mind and in his heart was, what would I regret most if my son died? As he pondered that question, the answer came clear. I would regret that he died never knowing how much I loved him. And I believe that this is the world we live in today. That this is the compassion we should have. That Jesus, Jesus' heart grieves over every soul. God grieves because those who died without Christ never knew how much he loved them. Point number one, compassion moves to action. Compassion moves to action. For those of us who don't understand compassion, it says that Jesus was moved with compassion. Because if you have compassion without action, you are simply just making an observation. If there's no action in your compassion, then you're not giving any satisfaction to the Lord above. Because what God desires is for you to be more like his son, to be miracle workers. And I have three points for us tonight and what's going to help us to be miracle workers in the Lord's harvest field. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 14. Compassion moves to action. Matthew 14 and verse 14. The Bible says, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As the evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Sounds like the campus household right there. He says, bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Talk about a golden corral buffet right there. You see, but first we have to appreciate the irony of the disciples telling the Son of God that it's dinner time. We're talking about the, 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 the entire aspect that Jesus is God. He's the one that created day and night, so he knows that it's late. He's fully God, but he's also fully man, so he knows what it means to be hungry. Secondly, we know that Jesus wasn't holding any of these people hostage here. So I tend to assume that the real reason that the disciples wanted Jesus to disperse the crowd was so that they could get some food. You see, I mean, what happens here? Your thoughts turn inward as soon as your stomachs begin to grumble. I mean, who's ever been hangry here? I've been hangry before. The good old Wawa, right? The disciples then tried to do what? They tried to get Jesus to do the work of dispersing the crowd. And then Jesus turns it right back around and puts the responsibility on who? On them. Notice Jesus doesn't respond by saying, you disperse the crowd. He says, you feed them. You see, this got me thinking. 
How often do we as disciples, as followers of Christ, sit back and expect Jesus to do the work that he himself has charged us to do? Maybe Jesus is asking you to feed people today. That might not mean physically feed them, but to spiritually feed them, to emotionally feed them, to feed them relationally, to meet their needs. Is that not what Jesus did? Question, who do you need to feed today? Is it yourself? Is it a friend who's looking for answers in, in all the wrong places? Is it a coworker whose marriage is so bad that the only person that can turn it around is God himself? Who do you need to feed today? You know, I remember my mom at a very young age, uh, you know, used to tell me that it's hard to see that others are starving when you're well fed. You know, we can go through life having incredible quiet times and incredible prayer life. And yet not feed the people that are starving because they have not been fed. Come on, bro. Who are we feeding tonight? You see, it says that when Jesus looked at these people, that they were distressed. They were dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. You see, I think the greatest joy that Jesus has is being able to use every single one of us to deliver people from that dreaded state that they were in. You know, I'm so excited um, that God has blown us over from L.A. over to Daytona Beach to start the good work there and to feed the people that are there. Because although it may be Daytona Speedway, these people are not running the race. For a majority of them, they're in the stands watching it happen. For a majority of them, they're in the pit crew, but they don't even know how to use the tools. For a majority of them, they didn't even know that there was a race going on. But I'm excited because we have people that have literally given up everything for the sake of of this message we have people who have given up everything because they know that God has called them to be miracle workers you see every single one of you are so much capable of doing so much more than you can even begin to imagine God has called you for such a time as this in the year of miracles to produce miracles so that we can give glory to the one who allows the miracles to happen. Amen. God's greatest joy, according to his word, in Luke 15, verse 10, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What brings God joy? His workers producing miracles for the sake and glory of his name. It says that, that the heavens, the presence of the angels, they rejoice. God rejoices. God is full of joy. So why does it feel like a burden when we get called to be miracle workers? It's because we have forgotten where God rescued us from and from who he rescued us from. You see, so many times... I, I really like to kind of ask questions just to really, you know, ponder and see where everyone's at spiritually. And I'll be like, bro, do you know what God saved you from? They're like, yeah, he, he saved me from my sin. Well, it's a little bit bigger than that. Uh, he, he saved me from, from Satan? Well, that guy's irrelevant, so we're, we, don't, we don't really need to talk about that guy. Uh, he, he saved me from my, my, my ex in the world. That's what he saved me from. No, that's not what he saved you from. What God saved you from was himself. It says that the wrath of God is being constantly poured over. Why? Because people have not understood the message of the cross. Romans 3.23 says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. That means that we cannot even begin to live a perfect life or have a perfect life 
to produce and go to God and be like, hey, can you accept me this way? The Bible says in Isaiah that your, your righteousness is like filthy rags. They're ratchet. They're dirty. There's nothing that you could possibly do that God would accept. The only thing that he accepts is that his son's blood covers over you tonight. Why should we be miracle workers? Why is there such a need? It says that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. It almost seems like people are starting to file for unemployment, but God is always hiring. There's a field that is waiting to be harvested. There's a field that God has specifically given to every single one of us to manage and to work. Why should we be miracle workers? Because you were part of the miracle that Jesus died for. What joy do we have in studying the Bible with people? We all know the story of, of Lazarus when he was buried in the tomb and everyone around was weeping. And then we get to see a very different side of Jesus. It says Jesus wept. One of the shortest passages in the Bible, but such a pivotal moment for us people who feel. He related with them. He experienced hurt. He experienced pain. He experienced suffering. And after he had wept, what did he do? He told Lazarus, get up. Yeah. Lazarus raised from the dead in linen cloth. This guy still was wrapped like a mummy coming out of the grave. Can you imagine that? I mean, we used to watch Chris Angel and we're like, dude. This guy is totally demonic. How is he floating in the sky? How does he cut people in half? How does he do all of these crazy things? Lazarus comes out from the dead. But this is the nugget that we all tend to miss. What was it that woke Lazarus from the dead? It was Jesus' words. What do you hold tonight? You hold his word. Yeah. And here's the, here's the thing that really started to trouble me. Jesus literally did 99% of the work in telling Lazarus to get up. And then after Lazarus raises from the dead, he tells his disciples, take his linen cloths off of him. I'm like, Jesus, you already did all of the heavy lifting. Why did you get these guys to take the linen cloths off of him? Because that's the joy that we have. That as we read these words and study the Bible with people, because we're miracle workers, because we're a product of his miracle, we are simply telling them to get up. And after we tell them to get up using God's word, guess what the joy is to us? Taking the linen cloths off of the dead person at the waters of baptism. Amen. Why would Jesus do that? Because he wanted you to feel a part of his ministry, a part of the miracle. Because he wants you to experience how it must have felt when you were raised back to life. So that that could keep you humble, so that could keep you hungry, so that that could help you be filled with what? Compassion. I need to get my mom. I need to get my dad. I need to get my brothers, my coworkers, my grandparents. My, 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 my people in my class, I need to get everybody here to wake on up and to join me to be a miracle worker. Yeah. Point number two, open your eyes to see the lost lives. Let's go to John 4. Open your eyes to see the lost lives. You see, I think for many of us, and I have fallen victim to this, is that we can tend to think that there is nothing that the world desires or even wants to have a relationship with God. But we have to understand that if Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, then it is plentiful. In John 4, verse 34, 
Let's see what Jesus says here. Let's go, bro. He says, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and have reaped the benefits of their labor. You see, while I know a little bit of farming, if you want to talk about farming, you, you probably want to talk to Martin Bentley right there. Uh, you know, who, who grew up as a cattle rancher, and he'll tell you everything there is to know about farming. But I do understand that ripened wheat takes on a golden hue when it's ready for harvest. However, if reaping is delayed, the grain begins to turn a pale white and will soon fall over on the ground. To speak of the fields white unto harvest, as what Jesus is saying here, is to stress the imperative of getting into the fields before it's too late. In the NASB, it says that the fields are whitened with harvest, signifying that there needs to be an urgency before this harvest dies off. And it is not connected to the true vine right there. There is always a sense of urgency to bringing in the harvest. Of the 6 billion people in the world, according to the stats here, it is estimated that over 30 million people worldwide will die without Christ this year alone. And of the over 300 million people in this country, it is estimated that 41% of the people are radically undoctrinated in what the Bible even teaches. Wow. That means that they don't go to church at all, not at Easter or Christmas, which is typically the, the, the main ones they go to, or to weddings or funerals. They, 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 they don't even decide to go and see what the Bible teaches. And if they were to die, they would go to eternal punishment without knowing the love and compassion and mercy of Christ. There's always a sense of urgency to bringing in this harvest. You see, an old statesman by the name of Vance Havner used to say, the tragedy of our time is that the situation is desperate, but the saints are not. We are living in desperate times. And desperate times demand desperate action. You want to know something that we need to really abhor and hold on to? Now, this is going to sound crazy. Do not neglect the power of a negative, desperate message. What do I mean by that? What am I talking about here? Come on, bro. Let us know. When God calls us to be miracle workers in his field, you have to understand the power of a negative and desperate message. Now, I'm not saying go and be negative to people. Amen. And I'm not saying go and be desperate to people. What I'm saying is that people have to understand where they're at in their relationship with God. Because before there can ever be good news, there has to be bad news in the first place. Well, what is the bad news? Are you in Christ? You see, bad news is what starts a revolution in today's world. We think about the time when uh, George Floyd, with all the hostility that was happening during that time period, George Floyd had caused an uproar to finally shed light on the social injustice that's been going on since the beginning of time. And then everyone started wearing shirts that said, I can't breathe. It took bad news to start a revolution. How many people today are not able to breathe because of Christ? How many people are being choked to death by their sin because no one is offering them the way, the truth, and the life? 
there is always a sense of urgency to bringing in this harvest. My third and final point, the harvest is priority. The harvest is priority. Let's go to Romans 10. You see, I pray that tonight, guys, we don't just allow ourselves to come into the conference and be wound up like a toy. And then that little wind up that we get is going to keep us going for about two weeks to a month. And then you're going to slowly start to just get unwinded. And then you're going to wait for another GLC to get all winded up. And then, okay, I got to slow back down. We're not here to get winded up. We're here to get built up and deeply rooted so that we can be workers for Christ. Romans 10 and verse 14. It says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You know what's going to take the harvest to be not only harvested, not only to be brought in, Guess what? The prayer was already answered. Those workers are you. The workers are you. And Jesus has allowed us to be in this harvest field as the main priority for our lives. Why? Because it is called the Great Commission, not the Great Omission. It's the Great Commission. Jesus commanded us to go into all the world to make disciples of all nations. And the biggest thing that we would fail to do is to not do the good that we ought to do. And instead of being a part of the Great Commission, we are therefore now participating in the Great Omission. You see, we need to know that in Tampa... There needs to be a light that is dawned on this city. Men and women who stand up. It doesn't matter if they're leaders. It doesn't matter if they lead a Bible talk. You have been called to be a missionary. You are a miracle worker. You can only perform miracles when you talk and know the one who performs them. What is it that compels you tonight? What is it that that keeps you awake? What is it that that motivates you, that propels you, that compels you? It should be the love of Christ. You see, we need to know that the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they saw the common people as what they would call chaff to be destroyed and burned up. Jesus saw them as a harvest to be reaped and to be saved. And yet the Pharisees in their pride looked for the destruction of sinners. But yet Jesus in his love died for the salvation of those sinners. You see, here lies one of the greatest truths of the Christian faith. The harvest will never be reaped unless there are reapers to reap it. Jesus needs men and women now more than ever to bring in the harvest. Jesus' disciples today need to see the people as Jesus saw them. As plentiful, as precious, as perplexed, and as perishing. What can we do? We can take responsibility for the field that Jesus has given us tonight. Think of all the people we contact every day. Family. Friends, neighbors, work associates, the woman at the dry cleaners, the guy at the car wash, the people you play basketball with or tennis or pickleball or at a sewing club. That is our field. We are responsible for them. We will never have a sense of urgency and priority until we realize that we are responsible for them. We need to go. 
There is no better time than today. There is no better time than the day that God wakes you up and he gives you another day of life. Because according to Lamentations 3, it says that his mercies have been renewed. Who have you renewed with those mercies you've been given? How have you shown mercy from the mercy that God's given you? We are miracle workers. And we need to be people that have compassion that leads to action. We need to have people that our eyes are open to the reality of where the world is. And we need to be people who truly have the harvest as a priority in the kingdom of God. Because I'm going to tell you the sad reality of where the world is. You see, I look around at, at every single one of us, and I can tell that so many of us either resemble our fathers or we resemble our mothers. We're all born unique, special, given talents by God. But the ultimate outcome of our lives means nothing if we did not allow our lives to be used by God in the first place. Here's the reality. You're born looking like your parents, but you die looking like your decisions. And we need to have a conviction. I want to challenge every single one of us tonight as I challenge the Daytona Beach Church. It took Nehemiah and the people of God to build the wall in 52 days. I want to challenge all of us tonight. What can God do in 52 days if you draw closer to him, if you pray more, if you fast, if you share your faith every single day? Not because there's a quota, but because God is giving his love and mercy to you every morning. What can God do in 52 days? Like it says in Ephesians, he can do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine. He only needed six to make what we live in today. And you want to know what he did? Rested on the seventh day in Daytona Beach. That's what he did. That's where he was. That's where he was. And he stretched his feet all the way to Tampa right there. But guys, there is a harvest, there is a need, and there is a need to be sent. Do you see the need tonight? In closing, let's go to 2 Corinthians 6. I pray you guys are fired up. I pray you guys are excited. I pray you guys understand the salvation that you've been given. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 1. As God's fellow workers, not fellow bums, not fellow rejects, not fellow sinners, not fellow screw-ups, not fellow derelicts, it says, as God's fellow workers, we urge you to not receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. I urge with you, I plead with you, and I warn you as I did before. Keep yourself saved from this corrupt generation. But bring those out that are being corrupted by the generation. And set the standard of the word of God above your life. Fast like you've never fasted before. Pray like you've never prayed before. Be deeply rooted in Christ who is your life. Share your faith out of what God's done for you, not for what you can do for him. The only thing you contribute to your salvation is sin consistently. 
That's the only thing you bring to the table. It does not depend on you. It depends on him who compels you and who controls you to spread this message so we can be miracle workers. I love you. To God be all the glory.